Here goes nothing. Here goes everything. And by nothing, I mean everything, including my clothes. Mm. Sorry. Adventures and podcasts. I'll put my clothes back on. Okay. You're still there, right? Yes, I'm here. Welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. I am Brad. And we are back from a break. How were your holidays, Brad? Filled with cheer. How about yours? Mine were filled with blue cheer. Ooh. Or was it Tide or Wesson oil? I don't know. Uh, We are here tonight to talk about Tragic Ceremony. 1972, directed by Ricardo Freda. That's right. That's the movie. Should we That's just... what we're going to talk about. Heck yeah. Should we just jump into this beast? Jump into it. Do it to it. All right. We're going to spoil this movie because no one's ever watched it. No. Now, mm-hmm. a few people have watched this movie, so... Some. For the Some few, people have. For the millions of you listeners at home who haven't seen it, be sure to not get spoiled by watching it first. You bastards. You bastards. <laughs> you bastards. You bastards. I mean, you nice people. Like all great movies, this opens with a sailboat. Right. Over the credit sequence, and some nice pop folk music. Uh, nice also translates to strident. Pop music. We join our gang, who I call Jane and the Good Time Gang. Uh, there's we got Bill. He's a son of a rich industrialist. We got uh, Fred, the guitar beardo. We have Joe, who's the goofball asshole guy, and then we have Jane, who's a girl. <laughs> Succinct. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about the cast later. Let's just keep. <laughs> Now that I've described half the movie, (laughs) they're on a boat and they're arguing over uh, the names of the sails. Joe is playing a trivia game with Bill to cheat him out of money. Because, of course, this trivia game, there's money at stake. Mm -hmm. And they use a strange form of currency. They talk about 10 pounds sterling because this is supposed to be England? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're in England. Sure. (laughs) Hey, Brad, are you in England, too? Yes, I'm in England daily. Nice. What I do in the morning is I play a montage of Big Ben, New Scotland Yard, (laughs) um, Carnaby Street. Oh, no. Yeah. They couldn't afford those shots in this movie. No. No, but Paul Nash, could afford them. Fuck yeah, he could. (laughs) They should have borrowed them. <laughs> Man, I wish Paul Nashi was in this. Paul Nashi makes everything better. Yeah, he would have had sex with Jane. Mm-hmm. No doubt. They go to a, a beach somewhere or some woods after, I guess, parking their boat or whatever. And uh they're hanging out, you know, like hippies do. Jane goes to get some water, and Bill follows, and he gives her a pearl necklace. Which is cursed. Now, before you perverts get all riled up, it's actually just a pearl necklace. Right. And yes, it is very curse. (laughs) Because when Bill goes to give her the necklace, we flash to Bill also giving the same set of pearls to his mother at their fancy mansion. She does not want them. No, especially not after he tells her what the fuck the deal is with them. Uh Uh-uh. It's like, oh, by the way, moms, they're totes cursed. Yeah. The family that bought them for someone all died horribly because they're possessed by evil demons or something. (laughs) Can I go ahead and say this is a total MacGuffin? Oh, no, man. That's the whole plot. No way. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. They they had nothing to do with anything. Oh, it's awesome. We go back to, to Jane and Bill. 
and she's very excited about this gift of pearls. So she's about to kiss him. Bill's making his big move, and then she sees him in a vision, dead or just blue. Probably dead. Yeah. And for some reason, that's a turnoff for her. Who knows? Instead of explaining anything, she just runs for it, leaving him very confused. Jane's kind of a weirdo. <laughs> yeah. So they're packing up to get to, you know, they're packing up camp to, to leave and move on. And Jane wants to stay where they are. Joe, the scumbag goofball, decides to, like, put the moves on Jane. And she's game. She's up for it. Not every guy you have a vision of dead, I guess. So, yeah, Jane's kind of a, a tramp. Because Bill just feels bad now. <laughs> He's like, hey, why didn't she want me? Um, Did you mention it was Camille Keaton that played Jane? Yeah, I have not mentioned any of the cast yet, because I'm okay. lazy. Yeah, it's uh, Camille Keaton from I Spit on Your Grave. Right. She is in this movie. <laughs> Sometimes I don't feel like she is in this movie. Yeah, it's an odd movie. Yeah. No I doubt. I can't blame her, though. I can't blame her that she feels detached. No. And that kind of lends itself to this film anyway. Oh, yes. Detachment. Yes. That night, their dune buggy, and I wrote dune buggy in all caps. Right. Uh, their dune buggy breaks down as a storm is gathering, so they push it to a gas station where they meet a character which should not be important, but is. They meet Sam David, the gas station attendant. I, in my notes, I have written Scarabo, comma, Dune Buggy Runs Out of Gas. What does Scarabo mean? I don't know. It's The word Scarabo is painted on the side of the Dune Buggy. Uh, how about this? We'll make it a contest. Okay. Folks at home, if you know what Scarabo means, you win a prize, and that's self-satisfaction. Exactly. <laughs> Scarabo. Maybe that's the name of the dune buggy. Let's see. This was after Twitch of the Death Nerve, wasn't it? That was 71. This is 72. Yes. Dune buggies were very popular in Italian <laughs> cinema at the moment. Thank at God. That time. Yeah. That's why we all drive them now. That's why I drive one. <laughs> I named mine Scarabo. <laughs> I do not regret my Scarabo tattoo. No, you don't. Anyway, I digress. Oh, of course. The gas station attendant, Sam David, is a real prick about them getting some gasoline. He makes them, like, go through this rigmarole with traveler's checks and an ID, and then he only agrees to give them gasoline because Jane makes some, uh, she, like, bats her eyes at him. Mm hmm Man. If only they'd known right away that's all it took. That's all it took. Then this scene wouldn't have been so amazing. <laughs> Uh, so they're headed to town in this storm. They break down in front of a mansion, and there's a bunch of cars lined up inside. So they just open the gate and push the car into the garage, and then we meet a very important man. Indeed we do. It is Lord Alexander. Lord Alexander. Played by none other than Luigi Pastilli. Fresh off of... Uh... Well, Twitch of the Death Nerve and uh, the Guana with a Tongue of Fire the year before. Yes, also uh, Ricardo Frida on that one. Absolutely. You know, that's a movie I want to rewatch very soon. Yeah, I enjoy that one quite a bit. It's got the uh, hilarious acid in the face moment. Man, Luigi had a great, great career. Yeah. He's... 71, Case of the Scorpion's Tail, the Guana with a Tongue of Fire. Bay of Blood, which is Twitch of the Death Nerve, 72, Caliber 9, Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, A White Dress for Marial, Tragic Ceremony. That's just two years. Wow. I forgot about Caliber 9 completely. Yeah. Which is a great movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, he welcomes them in, but it's very ominous. He's a very creepy guy, this Lord Alexander. He tells Lady Alexander, played by... Uh, what is her name? Uh, Luciana Paluzzi. Thank you, sir. And You're welcome. They're just weirdos. You know, they act yep. like they're stoned or they're about to have a black mass, either or. I remember back in the uh, 
in the 90s, it was always a toss-up. Guys, should we get stoned or should we have a black mass? <laughs> Sometimes we did both. <laughs> Man, you're so lucky. I only ever did black masses. <laughs> really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> did you say black mass or black molasses? <laughs> I said black M asses. <laughs> Oh, words. Words. They try pouring some gas into the dune buggy, and this this fickle little car won't go. So they push it back out into the rain for some reason, and then Lady Alexander insists they come inside and dry off, and they, she puts them up in their servant quarters while the guys are drying off. Lady Alexander takes Jane to get some dry clothes she insists that she takes a bath and jane is not happy about this right and i fully expected some lesbian scene but it does not happen no it doesn't i'm not disappointed but i was just so used to it from these movies that i was really confused (laughs) (laughs) so while the boys are playing poker uh and uh, Bill is complaining about his rich father being a dick. Jane is taking a bath, and she's really angry about those pearls. She's trying to take them off, but she can't get them off. Uh, and sure enough, Lord Alexander and Lady Alexander are holding a black mass downstairs. No doubt. I knew it. <laughs> those cheeky monkeys, as James Bond would say. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Hello? Did I lose you? (laughs) Never. (laughs) Okay, so while they're playing poker and worrying about Jane, they see Sam David, the gas station attendant, poking his head in the window, and it's unintentionally hilarious. Unintentionally hilarious. It's it's seriously like this guy stuck his finger in a light socket. His eyes are open so wide. The look on his face is crazy. Now Bill is really worried about Jane, and... Fred says not to worry because she has the face of Dracula. (laughs) Or maybe I dreamed that line of dialogue. (laughs) What about the crazy old lady that's playing the organ looking directly into the camera? Oh, shit. Speaking of Satanists, this whole whole satanic ritual is pretty great. They're sniffing from a giant incense ball. (laughs) And they're, uh, they're, uh, Luigi Pastilli's reading from their text, the the satanic whatever book. Right. Angelo del male, che eri nel cielo e che precipitasti nell'abisso infernale. Angelo del male, che eri nel cielo e che Angelo del male, Angelo del male, e che eri nel cielo e che precipitasti nell'abisso infernale. So, Jane goes exploring with a candelabra, like you do. Yes, and that is a trademark of Freda's. Every frickin' movie. I think the only one that doesn't have one of his horror films that I've seen is, uh, I don't think there's one in The Iguana with the Tongue of Fire, but there's one in The Ghost, there's one in Dr. Hitchcock, there's one in this, there's one in Murder Obsession. Yep. It's definitely a trademark of the director. Hey, when you got it, flaunt it. Yep, it's even it's the cover of Tragic Ceremony, actually, too. Sweet. It's a pretty good cover. I'm just going to say this now. This movie needed a seance. Yes. Actually, uh, did you see on Facebook we were talking about, I think it was David Person and I and you were talking about seances in Italian horror films. Oh, yeah. And how I never paid attention to them until I found out you had a thing for them and just in movies in general. We've talked about this before, but it's kind of like when you when you buy a Buick, then you see all these Buicks everywhere. You never noticed, but you just do it because you have one now. That seance sequence in Saving Private Ryan, that one feels tacked on. Yeah, a little, a little. But, I mean, it's Spielberg. It's going to be a little schmaltzy anyway. We're calling upon the spirit of Private Ryan. (laughs) 
while Jane is uh, descending the stairs in this beautiful mansion, the pearls really start to piss her off. And she does manage to break the necklace and the pearls go flying mm-hmm. down the stairs. In the uh, in the industry, it's called the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so Joe goes exploring to look for Jane. Jane finds the black mass and immediately joins it to be the sacrifice. Right. Oh my god, this is a great sentence. The boys join Joe... And they have found Jane's clothes. <laughs> Man, fuck this movie. <laughs> Here, let me just, let me read my notes and just get through this part. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? I'm ready. Do it. Jane wanders into Black Mass. Lord Alexander puts her on altar. Joe goes looking for her, joined by Bill and Guitar Dude. They barge in. Everyone is intoxicated with Satan. Lady Alexander gets it in the chest. All hell breaks loose. All black mass attendees kill each other, and hippies get away. <laughs> That's it. That covers it. The, uh, the only thing is that uh, uh, Bill is the one who accidentally kills Lady Alexander. But yes, yes you covered it. The, the The whole black mass just goes ape shit. <laughs> it's insane, and it's just the funniest gore freak out moment ever it's it's not shocking it's geniusly hilarious it is really good yep like this scene is my favorite part of the entire film i can see why it's like hippies wander onto the set of an italian gothic horror film and just do what hippies do fuck it up ruin everything (laughs) just mess it up with their free loving uh, what are some of the highlights in this gore reel here from, uh, who is it? Uh, Carlo Rimbaldi, you say? Absolutely. It's Carlo effects. Rimbaldi. Absolutely. Uh, there's a, um, like a sword to the face. It's yes. pretty good. Lady Alexander gets it in the chest. You know, it's often debated, but I will take these practical effects over CGI any day. Oh yeah. Especially the, uh. The was it the organ lady who's wandering towards the fire? Yeah, she's about to fall into the fire, and her head is the most ludicrously fake head <laughs> ever. It's so cute, and it's just like, wait, wait, why did they make her walk across the room with the fake head? Why didn't they just cut real quick? Ah, forget it, forget it. Yep. So after this slaughter. Uh, the Jane and the Good Time Gang, and they split uh, in their dune buggy, which now works all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they pull over to to kind of talk things over, and some cops show up. Cops uh, give them some directions. For some reason, Bill hides from the cops. This, like many other things in this movie, goes nowhere. They go back to the gas station to get some more gas, and they're convinced that. If if Sam David doesn't give them some gas, they're going to beat him up. The gas station, Brad, it's been abandoned for years. Yep, it's all burned out. Did you freak out when you saw that? A little bit. I, I'm like, what is going on here? Oh my god, I'm so scared. <laughs> Barely talk about this part. Okay, it's not scary at all. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, we'll get an info dump later that will explain this. Yes. Sure. Uh, they decide that they don't need gas after all. Let's go back to Bill's mansion. In the dune buggy that has not been working and working and not working and is working again, they go to Bill's mom's house, which is this humongoid mansion. Uh, Mom is not happy to see them. Uh, She wants them out of there as quickly as possible. She throws wads of cash at them to get them into a hotel for the night. Right. They start to leave. She asks Bill about that necklace. Where's that necklace, Bill? He pretends not to know anything. And again, I forgot to mention this early because it's so important. We see her lover is there. who's I think their lawyer. So she's sleeping with the lawyer while dad's away on a hunting trip. 
Yeah, they're having an affair. <sighs> wow, what a revelation I left out. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to have some words about this movie in a minute. <laughs> some of them are strong. Okay. Most of them are weak. Okay, so then, then you have the info dump where the cops, oh, who yeah. are only on screen for the reason of just dumping info, mm-hmm. say that the gas station owner has been dead 15 years, and he was the devil or a close relative. Oh, that shit's chilling. Like, he might have been the devil's uncle <laughs> or the devil's cousin. If we're not, They're not clear, so we're not clear. And then they break into Bill's dad's house. Yep. The, the, the country motorcycle. house. They turn the TV on. The TV is reporting about the Black Mass Massacre. Lady Alexander is missing. Uh-oh. And they say, this is reminiscent of Sharon Tate. Oh, my and God. And hippies are probably involved. Holy Which, shit. in my sideline as a private detective, that's usually the first thing I, I reach for. Are hippies involved? Probably. <laughs> this is probably hippie related. To the Manson family. <laughs> okay, the movie comes to a complete stop. Like, if not, then pause it. Because you need to wrap your mind around this. They are comparing this shit to the Sharon Tate murders, which just happened a few years earlier. And mm -hmm. it's just so... Like, I'm... It's just in bad taste. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they thought no one would ever see this movie anyway, so why not? And they do a tour of the crime scene, and that's the most one of the most effective parts of the movie is there's just blood everywhere in this mansion, and the, the cameras are trying to do that uh, Mondo kind of caught on tape kind of a look of things. And right. And it's, it's just really, really funny. Like, it just cracks me up that they tried to pull this off and even name drop Sharon Tate. They didn't make up some other fake thing. It's crazy. I love it. Jane, by the way, is sort of smiling during this entire report. She looks kind of naughty. Kind of, yeah. The next thing you know, uh, Bill is missing in the house, so Joe goes to look for him. And he opens up a closet, and he finds the, I call him Blue Bill. Uh, right. He is very dead, and it's pretty awesome because the makeup is just crazy. He's, like, drooling this blue drool, and he's got blue and green paint all over him, and uh, Joe's about to vomit. It's really funny. He goes and gets Fred and Jane, and Jane sees Bill's body and screams, so Fred calms her down by backhanding her in the face. Right. And uh, then the screenplay breaks for a moment. For a moment? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, check this out. So Joe is the one who discovered Bill's body. Then Fred starts to freak out. Fred acts like he's the one who discovered Bill's body. He keeps saying, oh, his eyes were staring at me. Oh, his eyes were looking at me. It's like... Whoa, 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 no. His eyes were looking at, at Joe. You just saw the body afterwards. It wasn't looking at you at all. So right. as Fred is having this complete physical meltdown and it just had going through this state, I was so confused. I'm like, shouldn't Joe be going through this since he was the one who was like scared when he found Bill? It's almost like they switch parts just for the hell of it. Yeah. Okay. Jane gives Joe a kiss while Fred is upstairs basically dying in bed. Uh, Jane comes to comfort Fred, but she's looking very evil. And uh, in the middle of the night, Fred goes to go to the bathroom and someone slits his throat. Which is odd. It almost looks like he did it himself, but you can't see anything because the uh, mirror was fogged up. Right. And the next morning, Jane finds Fred's body. Uh, she and Joe flee on a motorcycle together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they did ditch the uh, the dune buggy for some motorcycles. I forgot to mention that because also important to the plot. Yes. Hey, we're almost done with the plot. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, man. So they pull over, and they're walking through the woods. You know, it's a very romantic setting. It's a nice, beautiful day. Joe and Jane start to make out, but Jane changes somehow. What happens? She is all messed up. She is obviously dead. Mm-hmm. And, uh, let's see. Joe doesn't really care for it. <laughs> what a loser. Yeah, he's against it. He gets on a motorcycle and drives it off and <laughs> crashes it into a lake. <laughs> Which, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see the lake coming. His, uh, his leg is broken from the impact with the lake. <laughs> and, uh... He drowns. So uh, we're left with Jane. Yeah, she's just watching him drown. All of a sudden, Jane's in a mental hospital. Yes. Who's her doctor? <laughs> Paul Mueller. Paul Mueller. Yep. She's in this, this, this mental institution. It's called Mackle's Cross Mental Home. Right. I wrote that down. That means it's important. It's very important. Uh, the police inspector... Uh, who wants to question her is... Did I forget to write Milo Quesada. Oh, thank you. Yes, Milo Quesada. Thank you. Um, he is, who wants to question Jane, but uh, Dr. Paul Mueller is like, no, you can't. She's in some state. They take her to a room where we discover that she has one of those pearls. Oh, my goodness. She saved a pearl. Uh-huh. And we get a quick recap of the events at the uh, Black Mass. Which is awesome. Yeah, we needed that. Do, do, do. Okay, so this is where the movie gets weird. Gets weird? Yes, this is it. This is where it happens. The attendant, or uh, the, the the male nurse. Merce. The Merce comes, and he checks on Jane and leaves. But when he shuts the door, there's a ghost behind the door. A ghostly presence bathed right. in green light that... Walks up to Jane in her bed, and there's a scream. Someone we see as Jane is leaving, and the male nurses, or nurses, run right by her. They don't see her. And it turns out that Jane has a knife stuck in her. The sacrificial dagger from the satanic black mass of Satan. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. And in the driveway of the mental institution, there's a car waiting for Jane, and it's... Lady Alexander's car, she turns into Lady Alexander, and the driver is none other than Sam David, the gas station attendant. Amazing. Exactly. I mean, I, like, I had goosebumps on my goosebumps from this sequence. He's the devil's uncle. I think he's more of his foster father? Foster father, I like it. Thank you. (laughs) This is why I wish this movie was dubbed in English. For the final scene here. Uh Uh-huh. Um, honestly, people, like, I try to include clips of the dialogue in our podcast, but I'm not going to slap a big, long paragraph uh, or ten of Italian in here. No, because no one understands Italian but the Italians. Right. And, I mean, if we have Italian fans, write into us, people. Yes. Paul Mueller, Dr. Paul Mueller, explains what happened. And it goes on and on. <laughs> now, Lietta walked in just for this. She just sat down and got to hear this explanation. <laughs> and she's like, oh, wow, that was convenient. I'm glad I came in for that. She's like, this movie is really good where they have to explain everything when it's over. Yeah. Of course, Jane was already dead. Blah, 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 blah. That's the end of the movie. All right, look, here's the deal, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love, I love this movie. I cannot defend it upon screenplay grounds no. because <laughs> it is it is 150% atmosphere, and it does have atmosphere. It's got good camera work. Yep. It's got good good acting from the, like, Pistilli and um, Pelu- uh, Peluzzi. Yep. It's a good movie. Is it a classic? No, probably not. I do really enjoy it. Yeah. It's but it's all atmosphere. There are so many plot threads that are just dropped that don't go anywhere. Oh my God. There's there is a lot of them. 
And it is basically hippies wander into a black mass and mess it up. Yep. And then if you guys hate this this movie and this episode, you can blame me because it was my <laughs> idea. It's probably a terrible idea to try to discuss this film. But and really when when I think about it, I'd probably put it last in Freddy's horror filmography, even though I do love the film. I think it's got yeah. a lot of it's got a lot of style. It's not the ghost, it's not the horrible Dr. Hitchcock. It's not murder obsession, which, no. you know, but I do, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, the black mass stuff is awesome. It's very, uh, very The good. hippies don't really do it for me. Basically, it's Nixon who killed the hippies. So I blame Nixon. <laughs> but no, I think, I think it's a good movie. You can get it right now for like 16 bucks on yeah. Amazon. I think it's worth 16 bucks. I know Simon really liked it. He saw it this year, but it really is style over substance, atmosphere over any kind of discernible screenplay. Yes. You know, it, the hippies kill everybody at the Black Mass. Lady Alexander takes over Jane's body, gets revenge, and then drives off in a car with a gas station owner who is the foster father of the devil. <laughs> I, if you like Lisa and the Devil... That sort of film, this one is not nearly as good, obviously, but it kind of slots into that kind of film, sort of. Yeah. Frida made better films, but for my money, you know, Camille Keaton walking down the stairwell with the, oh, the candelabra, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Classic. And I know with your editing magic, you will make that rambly discussion of a plot make sense. Oh, of course. I'm a genius. No, I, I can't fix the screenplay. <laughs> That's not what you said. <laughs> now, I too love this movie in spite of the stupid shit going on in it. Uh, I think the screenplay is just awful. It's confusing. It's credited to three friggin' people. Like, how did three people get together? One of them is Mario Bianchi. Uh, yes. Who directed La Bimba di Satana, that classic. Oh, I've been hearing a lot about that lately. Oof. Porno. Oh, well, softcore anyway. This feels to me like if you wanted to make a gothic horror film in 1972, no one was going to support you and nobody was into it because, dumbass, you're supposed to be making a giallo. Right. But... Ricardo Freda delivers on the things that he's good at, uh, i.e. candelabras. Yeah, I mean, that scene where she's coming down the stairwell oh, and the uh, beautiful the, the billowy curtains are yeah. blowing. The fisheye lens. I mean, it's good stuff. Yeah. Fisheye lens. Yeah. The music, supposedly, is by Stelvio Cipriani, or Cipriani. Yeah. And it's some of his worst. <laughs> It, I fucking hate most of the music. That, now, don't get me wrong. The incidental stuff, there's some really beautiful passages. Whenever anything horrifying is going on, the music sucks. I want to play some of it for you right now. It sounds like library music. It does not do anything for me. I really despise this 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 part of the soundtrack. There's just something missing from this movie, and I hate to say it, but I think it's softcore porn. Mm. Not that I want it there, but think about what this movie would have been like in 1977. Ugh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before we get into the cast and all that jazz, like my last thing is like this reminds me of Death Smiled at Murder because of the whole undead woman thing. Right. And the mysterious strangeness and an intentionally strange and confusing plot. Of course, this got away from them, and it's <laughs> beyond intentionally. Yeah. You were spot on there. Yep. I was just saying that it got away from them. <laughs> and uh, this happily reminds me of Murder Obsession. Like, I'm really jazzed to watch Murder Obsession again now. I love Murder Obsession. I will defend Murder Obsession on actual, real, concrete grounds. Not just because you like it. 
<laughs> right, right. As opposed to this, where I just, I like it. I mean, it, it looks good. It's well shot. It's well lit. Yeah. The effects are good from Rambaldi. The music's crap. And I would say that whatever little money it made on DVD, because it's a nice DVD from Dark Sky, I would say Dark Sky made more money than whoever it is put it out. <laughs> Nice. Probably the 14, 15 copies. Do you have a copy of this? Absolutely. So me and you, who else has a copy? Does Jeffrey have a copy? We'll find out. I'll ask him about it. I bet he does. You should ask. He better. He better. <laughs> Some of the highlights of the cast and crew here. Um, obviously, Ricardo Freda, we love very much. Mario Bianchi, I mentioned before, he's a second unit director on Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Yeah. Getting obscure there just to defend the guy. Right. Jose Guterres Maiso, he did a lot of co-writing. He was like the third wheel on a lot of stuff, like he right. is here. He co-wrote Hellbenders, Minnesota Clay, My Dear Killer. Uh, he was also a producer of uh, Two Faces of Fear, uh, that Giallo. And unfortunately, he was the producer on House of Exorcism. Oh, the third writer I didn't have any any information on really was uh, Leonardo Martin. Not sure who he is. Right. Moving on to the cast, Camille Keaton. She had some interesting titles. Uh, one of them is not called Sex of the Witch. Nope. That is not a good movie. That's in my bottom three worst Gialli of all time. Uh, she's very funny in the interview. I watched a little bit of her interview, and she says that nobody knows what that movie's about. Right. And she's right. I haven't even seen it. Oh, you'll watch it one day. <laughs> you always warn me against it. <laughs> Just watch it. I want to share my pain. You and Jeffrey will do an episode on it, I guarantee it. You know, I, I thought about that right before you said that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think Jeffrey and I would potentially attempt to do Sex of the Witch, but it gets so garbled that we'd need like a team of assistants to help us stay on task on that one. Well, I mean, you made sense of In the Folds of the Flesh and Delirium. Did we, though? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, my God. I think Jeffrey saved the day on the uh, the Delirium one, because he was more familiar with the with both versions of the movie. Right. And I was just... I like both of those quite a bit. I was just drowning. Well, I like In the Folds of the Flesh better oh, than yeah. Delirium. That's a great movie. Yeah. And so colorful. Holy shit. Oh, yeah, we're still talking about this movie. <laughs> Uh, Camille Keaton also in What Have You Done to Solange, which is my favorite of her performances in an Italian film. Right. I, you know what? I don't think that film is as good. That's one of those Gialli that everybody loves that I don't. Really? Yep. Interesting. I, it I, just it never, it never did it for me. I own it. It was definitely one of my first non-Argento Gialli. And, uh, That'll probably do it. I ended up watching it probably more times than I should have. It's got some real dickhead characters in it, that's for sure. I.e. Fabio yeah. Testi. Man, I've got the movie going, and it's at the Black Mass scene where everybody's getting killed. And nice. there's really some good stuff there. They shoot Pastilli Lord Alexander in the head, <laughs> and he just spurts blood. And then they cut somebody's freaking head off, yep. and all this And the body hits the floor. Blood. Oh, man. And then somebody jumps out a window. It's crazy. Isn't it great? Yeah, it's 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 really good. Like, I'm watching it without the sound on, which is probably the preferable way to watch it. <laughs> that helps with the probably. fucking music. Add your own soundtrack. Exactly. Do, 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 do. <laughs> God, this is all my fault. I apologize. Tony Isbert plays Bill, the son of the rich industrialist. He was in uh, the Dracula saga. And Ooh, that's a crazy movie. He was also in Enigma Rosso, a.k.a. Rings of Fear. Speaking of What Have You Done to Solange, it was a related film. Yeah. Maximo Viverde, he plays Joe. Uh, he was in Pensione Paura, which is a creepy giallo. Mm -hmm. uh, Luigi Pastilli, we already talked about him. Uh, Luciana Paluzzi, uh, Lady Alexander, she was in Two Faces of Fear. And, unfortunately, A Black Veil for Lisa another one that I've always wanted to see but avoided because you said it was terrible. Hey, give it a shot. Maybe you'll like it. I've watched it twice, and both times I was just just annoyed with it. It's It feels like they wrote it for Carol Baker, 
but she was too uh-huh. busy with uh, Umberto Lenzi, so they gave it to Luciana Paluzzi, who I like in other things. It's just not, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, Jose Calvo, who played the very important Sam David character, he was in a lot of spaghetti westerns, definitely a character actor. Before we get to the amazing Paul Mueller, Irina Demick, uh, she played Bill's mother. Um, her character in this movie is nothing to write home to mom about. Uh, but she's in a great giallo called Naked Girl Killed in the Park. Ooh, yeah. Speaking of movies I want to rewatch over and over again. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. A lot of fun. That's a lot of fun there. Uh, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Paul Mueller, huh? Paul Mueller. Man, I've seen this guy in so many movies before I re- started to like remember him. And now, because of Eugenie de Sade, I love this dude. Mm-hmm. Folks at home, go to the archive and listen to our Eugenie de Sade episode. Whenever I see him, I think about you talking about his hairy back. Oh, God. Yep, he's, he's a sexy guy. The cop, Milo Quesada, this guy was all over the place. Um, he was in The Evil Eye, Black Sabbath, The Tenth Victim, The Bloody Judge, and a bunch of other stuff I'm forgetting. There was a Nashi person in the movie. I don't know if you saw her. Who was it? Uh, Elsa Zabala. She was one of the Satan worshippers. Was, was that? she the, old la- the older lady? Yeah. She was in uh, Horror Rises from the Tomb and uh, Dr. Jekyll vs. the Wolfman and a couple other of uh, Nashi's major horror works. Uh, Curse of the Devil, Vengeance of the Zombies. Oh, uh, yeah. She's in the Dracula Saga as well. Oh, shit. I didn't see that. Yep. Nice. I need to rewatch Dracula Saga. I did not like it the first time at all. If you throw away any any idea you've ever had about Dracula, just throw it out the window before you watch it. <laughs> well, you know I'm a purist. Yeah, that's true. You're going to hate it again. <laughs> no, I think I was just not into the movie. Huh? I can... uh, it's a Klamowski, isn't it? Oh, isn't yeah. Leon Klamowski? As yeah. far as I know, yeah. It, yeah, it's fun. Nice. It's I, bizarre. I blame myself. Blame the hippies. That's what I do. <laughs> they killed all the Charlie Mansons. Wait, what? The cinematography for this movie was by Francisco... Francisco. Francisco Frail. Um, he shot, coincidentally, Dr. Jekyll versus the Wolfman. And he shot Ooh. Brad favorite, Glass Ceiling. Ooh, I do like the Glass Ceiling quite a bit. That's a future episode right there. Yeah, that's a good one. Crazy movie. Yeah, I like that one a lot. That's got um, uh, Patty Shepard in it, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah, I like that one. Um, The trivia for this movie is very limited, other than the few little uh, tidbits that uh, Camille Keaton talked about on the, the interview on the disc. It is public record that Ricardo Freda resented directing this movie. And they wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't let him take his name off of the picture, which is funny because he's credited as, like, what, Robert Hampton or something? Robert Hampton. <laughs> and the last thing is the title for this movie in Italian is not Tragico Ceremonio or something. <laughs> <laughs> the Italian title is very long, and I found a translation of it. <clears throat> it is Extracted from the Secret Archives of the police of a European capital. Which I don't know why they didn't go with that. It's catchy. It was also called Get the Fuck Out of My Face, Dumbass Title. <laughs> go away. What the fuck? What the living fuck? Oh my gosh. Brad, do you have anything to add to this? <laughs> nope. Nope. I've said my piece. I like it. Yeah. It is bizarre. Yeah. I, I I recommend it with very, very strong conditions that you forgive me. And right. it's 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 terribly written, but it's fun movie. Yeah. It's it's like Brad said, it's worth just seeing Camille Keaton in a flowing white gown walking down some mysterious stairs. Uh I did have one thing I wanted to look up before we moved on. Because I love the the frickin' interiors of this castle dealy, but I don't know. It doesn't say where it was filmed other than the city. 
Yeah. No, I don't know where it was filmed. Never mind, I'll cut that part. Waka waka. Waka waka. Un sogno crudele. Questa è la vita. Tu allunghi una mano nel buio. Nella vana ricerca di una mano fraterna. E ferre a una stretta. Cina nel nulla For question time I thought I'd take over for no reason other than I had an idea and I fully intend to copyright this idea cuz it's badass It is badass Um I decided that we should use our imaginations and uh come up with a fake horror movie much like the fake horror movie soundtracks of horror Available now at GoblinHouse.com. <laughs> that was a plug, y'all. Okay, so here's what I posed to Brad. Pretend that this year, someone opened a vault in Italy and discovered a lost horror film. It was completed, but shelved in early 1975 because the production company folded. Pick your dream director, writers, cast, composer, director of photography, locations, and plot. The only rules are that you are allowed to bleh, bleh. The only rules are that you are allowed only one non-Italian cast member. Everyone must have been actively making movies and or still alive in 1975 and the film can have some giallo God bless America. And the film can have some giallo elements, but at heart must be a horror film. Whew. Even reading that was hard. What did you come up with, Brad? Okay. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to explain something first, and then I'm going to just tell you like it's a pitch okay. for a film. Nice. All right. It's 1974, late 1974. A young man has graduated from film school at USC and is taking an Italian vacation. That man... John Carpenter. <laughs> At a bar in Italy, he runs into Ernesto Gastaldi. They strike up a conversation. <laughs> I don't know if Gastaldi knows English or if Carpenter knows Italian, but this is my question time. So <laughs> this is what happened. Gastaldi says, I've been having trouble with a certain screenplay and I don't really have time to flesh it out because I've written 17 movies this year alone. <laughs> It's, so, <laughs> Carpenter says, "Let me take a, let me take a, a stab at it." Okay, so now I'm going to pitch it to you. Screenwriter John Carpenter. Okay, gotcha. Director Hugo Libatore from Death in Venice. That will nice. make more sense in a minute. Cinematographer Joe Diamato yes. under his real name. Aristus Stadi Macassessi, whatever. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher some names here. Please do. Composer, composer, Piero Piccioni. Yes. Effects by Carlo Rambaldi. Okay. Of course. Starring Franco Nero, Edwige Fenech, Susan Scott, George Hilton, and William Shatner. <laughs> Co-starring Pierre Paolo Capone, George Rigaud, and Luciano Pigozzi, the Italian Peter Lorre. Nice. Okay, so the name of this film is The Twelve Victims of Pisces, but there are only five victims. But we're, that just lends to the credence that Italian horror films don't really make a lot of sense. Right. So, The Twelve Victims of Pisces, 1975. Here is the synopsis. Okay. Franco Nero and his girlfriend, Edwige Fenech. And I know it's it's pushing it just to have all these mainstream people in it, but it's this is my fake movie, damn it. They are on vacation in Venice. Okay. They befriend William Shatner, who is running a newsstand, like a little coffee shop newsstand place. He is an American, but his grandmother owned it, and she has died, so he has come over to run it for a little while and try to decide what to do with it. Meanwhile, bodies keep showing up, 
drained of blood, all wet, right outside the canals, with a Pisces medallion by the body. Okay? Yes. They meet some other people. They meet another couple, played by Susan Scott, George Hilton. Lots of uh, 1975 fashion, 1975 music. To make a long story even longer, here's what happens. Franco Nero discovers that they are a cult that worships some sort of fish god named Pisces. And they are killing all these bodies, stealing the blood, in order to reanimate their fish god. And then the very last scene, the camera goes down a hallway, and a door opens. And it's Franco Nero in the arms of his girlfriend, Edwidge Fennec, except... She All she is is tentacles and a head, and he is crying. <laughs> and that's the end of the movie. Dude, I want to see that. Dottie, too. <laughs> Holy shit. That's way better. That's Right now, just saying, that's way better than my piece of shit that I made. <laughs> Hell no. Come on. <laughs> but no, I, 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 uh. I wanted Hugo Libertore to direct it because I wanted it to have that weird off feeling that Death in Venice has. And it, the fact that it takes place in Venice really is coincidental. Absolutely. To, uh, to the director. But yeah, and I want to call it The Twelve Victims of Pisces, but there's only like five victims. The William Shatner, because, that, that, that sold it. You'll get, yeah, Nafa, I, you'll get Nafa on that. That's right. Yeah. I'm that's trying to reach out to all my, uh, constituencies all my demographics there <laughs> and really it's cheating you said one american oh it's okay and i ended up with two that's all right one in the cast one in the uh in the crew but uh no like there's this whole mystery and it turns out that they're the cult and william shatner his grandmother didn't even, it wasn't even his grandmother he just killed the lady that owned it before and just took place because he wanted to help the Dude. cult Love Resurrect it. Pisces, the fish god. So it's a little bit, of course, it's, you know, every movie is pretty much an amalgamation of other films. So you got a lot of, uh, you know, you got some H.P. Lovecraft with the tentacle fish god. I don't know if that's like Dagon. I haven't seen Dagon, but, but yeah, anyway, that was, it was a lot of fun to do. I really enjoyed this question time. Nice. I'm glad I could uh, come up with something semi original for a change. We'll do no, this again. Good. I have, I do have an idea for this again, so I'm going to write it down and remember it for a different episode. Nice. It's going to be hot. Well, let's hear yours. All right. So I'm going to read you my plot. Okay. Uh, the movie is called Five Hands of the Devil's Monster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love it. Okay. The reason this movie was shut down shortly after it was produced was that it was sued by a certain filmmaker to have it stopped. Um, and I will tell you who that was after I tell you the plot. Okay. After witnessing the slang of his gangster father, a man named Paolo, played by Franco Nero, <laughs> must nice. decide if he wants to take his place at the head of the family business. Meanwhile, his young daughter, played by Nicoletta Elmi, begins showing signs of satanic possession. As she succumbs to the evil, a rash of kidnappings and bank robberies are being committed all over the city by Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> played by George Eastman. Of uh, course. The uh, Dr. Frankenstein is played by Umberto Rajo. Nice. Paolo's wife is killed. Uh, she is played by uh, Anita Strindberg. Mm. She is killed during one of these crimes, and Paolo and his mistress, played by Krista Nell, she's the non-Italian, lure the monster back to his secluded countryside castle to exact bloody revenge. Did I mention this was a sex comedy? You have now. Okay. Uh, this was stopped uh, from being produced by um, Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> Because of the, the lifting of dialogue from The Godfather. Wow. In the gangster sequence at the beginning of the movie. This film, uh, this doomed film, was directed by Ricardo Freda. Wow. Who was immediately fired after two weeks of shooting. He was replaced by Luciano Ercoli, who wow. owed a favor to the producer. Uh, this was written by Ernesto Gastaldi, uh, because who else would have written this? 
Uh, but he had some script supervision by Lucio Fulci. Yes. And the cinematography is by Cecilio Panuagua. I'm mispronouncing that. But he filmed Lisa and the Devil. Ooh. Uh, the music score is by Alessandro Alessandrini, uh, who did the awesome uh, score for Killer Nun. <laughs> I-, I meant that sincerely. Although, wow. I s- although I said it with a smile on my face. Mm-hmm. Uh, the locations where this is shot, and this is very important, it was shot... Uh, the exteriors were shot in Tampa, Florida. Wow. He, he's one of those infamous Tampa gangsters. Um, and also at Bal Serrano Castle, uh, where they filmed uh, the Christopher Lee Italian Gothic Crypt of the Vampire and a bunch of other ones. Uh-huh. And, of course, um, the rest of it was at uh, Chinachita Studios. Wow, that's it. That F- is awesome. Five hands of the devil's monster. I love it, dude. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We used our imaginations. See, see what you did plays right into mine because Gastaldi was so busy. <laughs> that's so awesome. Writing so many movies, he was too busy writing that one. Didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. I guess we should make our announcement. Do it. All right. So we've decided that. We've been neglecting a certain director for the last two years of the show. (laughs) Uh, We are going to get back to Lucio Fulci, or as we call him, what do we call him, Brad? The Fulch. The Fulch. The very next episode that Brad and I do, it may not be the next episode of the show, but the next episode that you and I are going to talk about is Manhattan Baby. Manhattan Baby. It's a controversial title in Fulci's uh, films, because right in the middle no of doubt. his uh, goriest period, he made this weird movie without any gore in it. Oh, Manhattan Baby. And people love it or hate it. And I have never watched the whole thing. I've never made it through that film to this day. And Really? I'm, I'm serious. And that makes me very excited about covering it for this episode we're going to do. But there's more. There's even more. We are going to get back to covering the rest of the Fulci movies that we've been avoiding covering for years. Yep. This is the year of the Fulci. Yep. We're going to bring it all back and hopefully wrap it up. I'm on Facebook. I don't know if I was on Facebook last time, was I? Uh, No, I don't think Uh, so. I've made some friends on Facebook. Oh, shit. David Person, who I mentioned earlier. Troy Howarth. Mm-hmm. author of The Haunted World of Maria Bava and the soon-to-becoming Splintered Visions, the Fulci book. I'm as excited well about as that book. Giallo book. Scott McDonald of EurocultAV.com. Oh, yeah. We talk quite a bit on Facebook. He's a cool cat. It's been a very exciting start to the year. I apologize for Tragic Ceremony. <laughs> I... Hope that people go, oh, I better stop listening and go watch it first. Then they come back all pissed off. That'd be great. Yeah, then they don't come back at all. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> Excellent question time, sir. Thanks. Your your answer was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Your answer was also amazing. Five hands for the devil's monster. Yep. <laughs> Man. Oh, you got to get George Eastman in there somewhere. Poor guy. Poor guy. Yeah. So, folks, thanks for listening. Uh, Thanks for sticking with the show and putting up with our our break with the uh, full disclosure that it was me who needed a break from editing the show. Because recording the show is always fun. It wasn't really a break to people that didn't know, was it? Well, yeah. It was was an interruption in service only if you're in the the Tampa Bay area. (laughs) Because, I mean, you kept releasing shows. Yeah, that's true. Hey, there could be more of those uh, Doomed Show Presents coming up, too. Could be. Could be. When we talk about... um, Fly fishing. Talk about what? Fly fishing. Yep. Or uh, just just flies. Men's flies. The zippers. Yeah. Four flies on uh, red velvet. (laughs) Or four flies on some velvet pants. Yeah. Or uh, corduroy. Ooh. (laughs) Now you're getting steamy. 
Follow us on Twitter. At Doomed Moviethon. Finally, on Twitter. See, we, we're social medias. We are. Uh, we did start something new as well, I just remembered. Uh, we have something we call Movie Party. And uh, on Twitter, you can follow along as we watch a probably European horror film. Um, it's going to be... The next episode is going to be the film Werewolf Shadow. And the hashtag is uh, Nashy Shadow. So N-A-S-C-H-Y-S-H-A-D-O-W. I think I spelled that right. And it's midnight on, let's see, Saturday, January 31st. So if you're hearing this too late, I'm sorry. At midnight Eastern Central Time, start your Werewolf Shadow movie either on tape or DVD or just read along in your Werewolf Shadow coloring book and uh, join us while we watch a movie. It's, it was a lot of fun. We did pieces you did do pieces, and it was a hell of a good time because pieces is amazing. And I learned something about pieces, Brad. Did you know this? What did you learn, Richard? If I ever have a party, ever, like where people come over to hang out, uh huh, I'm putting on pieces. You're putting pieces on. Fuck yeah, man! That's what you're doing? It's a good time. Flick. People do love pieces, and they should. Well, sir. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. And um, to the folks at home, thanks for listening. Very much. Later. Bah. If you would like to contact Hello, this is The Doomed Show. Please email us at doomedmoviethong at gmail.com or check us out at facebook.com slash hello doomed show. We are also on Twitter. Sorry about that. At Doomed Movie Thong Hashtag Hello Doomed Show For the old ass episodes that you missed Find our archived episodes at doomedmoviethong.com Don't forget to eat fruit and veggies Hello, my name is Rod Barnett I'm Troy Gwynn And we are your genial co-hosts for Nashy Cast, the podcast about the films of Paul Nashy. If you don't know who Paul Nashy is, you need to learn. Spanish horror icon, writer, director, actor, makeup artist. He is all of these things and more. Paul Nashy, one of the greatest genre filmmakers of all time. New titles like Horror Rises from the Tomb, Vengeance of the Mummy, Werewolf Shadow, House of Psychotic Women, Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll, Mark of the Werewolf, make you want to see more? Watch the film, then come hear our stunning, brilliant commentary. <laughs> stunning and brilliant. That's us. Think that's too egotistical? Think that sounds silly? Think we come off as assholes? Look, if nothing else, let us tell you this. Blood, nudity, beautiful women, werewolves and turtlenecks. Nipples. Lots of nipples. Both male and female. Yeah... I don't know if anybody's going to want to listen to us after this, man. <laughs> Find us at The Bloody Pit of Rod, or... You can subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a listen. And if we scare you too much, well, maybe Spanish horror is not your thing. I don't know. Cinema and Furrier. It's almost time, kids. The clock is ticking. Join Sparkle City Phil and the Sars for Cinema Inferior. We only review the best horror and sci-fi movies. It puts the B in B movie, that's for sure. As a result, we take the show seriously, and our approach is very sober. Yeah, I was thinking about playing Nine from Outer Space, man. I had to crack a Coors Light on that one. <laughs> We appreciate our audience and respect your input. You know what? I'm sorry, but you're all wrong, and you should burn in hell. And in return, we bask in the adulation of our adoring fans. You know what? Fuck your podcast. <laughs> so join us bi-weekly for the show. Hurry home. And don't forget the plot giveaway. The clock is ticking. It's almost time. Cinema 
Inferior. Available on Stitcher, iTunes, at cinemainferior.com, and a member of the Tangent Bound Network. 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 And a member of the Tangent Bound Network.